I started teaching last night out of John chapter 13. Let's just turn back over there and start with these verses. Again, John chapter 13. Jesus was speaking to his disciples the night before his crucifixion, and he said in John 13, 34, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. I think people skip over that quick, too quickly and haven't had the full impact of it, but this is one profound passage of Scripture that we love others as He has loved us. And I've made a bunch of points through this. One of them is that you can't love other people until you first of all receive the love of God. And this is why most people aren't walking in love and they get so ticked off at people, short-tempered, and have unforgiveness and bitterness in their heart is because we have been given a wrong impression of God's love for us. Religion has taught us wrong, and it's taught that God is very condemning and harsh and judgmental and critical and always looking for something. And if you don't live right and earn it, then God won't move in your life. Most people believe that God moves in their life proportional to their performance. And that is not what the Word of God teaches. And so that's what I've started trying to do is to show us that God's love for us is different than what most people have understood. And then the next verse, I also use that, it says, then, uh, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. And the distinguishing characteristic of a Christian is not their morality, it's not their dress, it's not all of the things that many people would look for to see if you are truly a Christian. The distinguishing characteristic of a Christian is love, God's supernatural love for other believers. Man, that's a strong statement. And this is why the world haven't known that we were his disciples. This is why so many people write us off is because there is so much division and criticism among the body of Christ, even for ourselves. And uh, Jesus said that this is how the world would know that we are his disciples. In the 17th chapter of the book of John, he prayed a prayer this same night, and he prayed, Father, make them one that the world may know that you have sent me. And when we become one, and when there begins to be true love and unity among brothers and sisters, that is going to be the greatest testimony to the world that uh, the body of Christ has ever given. We put a lot of effort into radio and television. I do that. I'm not against it. But I'm saying that the greatest testimony is not television, radio, and things like this. It's the love, the unity among the believers. And uh, we haven't been walking in that. So this morning, I turned over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I want to go back there. I only covered a small portion of that one verse. And uh, I started talking about that this is Paul's expose on God's kind of love, what it's like. He talks about what God's kind of love uh, is and wasn't what it isn't, how it acts, and how it doesn't act. He just covered all of the bases, and this is tremendous. And many of us have heard teaching from these verses about how we're supposed to love others. But what I specifically started this morning, and I want to continue it tonight, if God commanded us to love others like this, then God himself certainly will live up to his own expectations. God would never demand more of us than what he is willing to give. And I've been showing, most of us believe that we're supposed to turn the other cheek, that we're supposed to be kind, that we're supposed to be patient, that we're supposed to do these things with other people, but most Christians don't believe God is that way with us. They see God as a very harsh, a very critical God that is constantly judging them and just looking for some excuse to let you have it. And I started talking about that this morning, and all we got through was in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4, where it says charity, that's talking about God's kind of love, suffers long and is kind. That's all I covered this morning. I'm going to try and go a little faster, but I'm not going to promise anything, amen. I just don't want to miss this. I don't have an agenda. I'm just trying to get across some of the things that God has shown me personally about how much he loved me. And if, it, if, if we only cover one verse... The rest of the week, I don't care, just as long as we can get that point across. And so, um, anyway, I'm going to try and speed up, but I'm not promising nothing. If you missed that message this morning, I would encourage you to, 
to uh, get the CD. We have the CDs of last night and this morning, and then tonight's will be duplicated within five minutes of the close of this. CDs and DVDs. You need to get this and listen to it, because uh, I've never heard other people preach these things. I'm sure that they do. No one person has a revelation of everything, but I'm saying it's not said very often. And we need to understand God is uh, long-suffering with us and kind. God will treat you kindly. God will say positive things, reinforce you. God is not against you. And yet religion basically has presented a God that is just half ticked off and he's looking for you to step out of line. I know that when I was in Vietnam, I hadn't renewed my mind. I'd experienced the love of God, but I still had my mind steeped in all of the stuff that had been taught me. And I wanted to be a witness in Vietnam much better than what I was. And I just felt so inadequate. I felt like I failed God. I wasn't, I'd only led a few people to the Lord. And I wanted to lead every person I saw to the Lord. And I just felt like I was failing and I wasn't living up. And I actually felt like God just put me on the shelf and that he was through with me. God was put out with me because I was put out with myself. I was embarrassed and I wasn't as bold witnessing as I would have desired to be. And so because of that, I just felt like I couldn't tolerate myself. How could God tolerate me? And one of the things I learned, praise God, is that I'm a new person in the Spirit and God's looking at me in the Spirit and He sees me differently than I see myself. But at that time, I didn't know that and I thought God was just through with me. And it put me aside. And you know, I'm saying this for a reason, because I bet you that there is a bunch of people sitting right here in this room that you don't doubt God exists, you don't doubt that He's a good God and that He has power, but the problem is you doubt that He would use you and move in your life because you haven't been what you should be, and you feel like God has just put you aside. And I tell you, that's wrong. This right here says God is long-suffering and is kind. And the next thing it says... Charity, God's kind of love, envieth not, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Now I'll admit, in the King James, this is a little bit old English and wordy. So I printed out some other translations for those of you that don't ever go and study out what the words mean. I'll just put it in some other wor words for you, okay? Here's the Amplified. It says, love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious, nor boils over with jealousy, is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. That's all verse 4. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Here's the NIV. It says, Love is patient, and love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. In the Message Bible, it says, Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. And remember that I'm not making the application primarily about how we should be treating others, but I'm saying that God is love, 1 John 4, 8. So if we're talking about God's kind of love, we're talking about how God is. This is how God is towards you, and God never gives up. Love never gives up. Love, or God, never cares more for... He always cares more for others than for self. God doesn't want what it doesn't have, Love or God doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head. That's the Message Bible. Here's the Living Bible. Love is very patient and kind, never jealous or envious, never boastful or proud. You know, we, sec we recognize this in people that we think that people should operate in humility and that you shouldn't go around promoting yourself and talking about how awesome you are. The Scripture says, let another man's lips praise you and not your own. Did you know that God is like that? I quoted these verses earlier uh, this morning in Matthew chapter 11. I believe it's around verse 29, somewhere around there. He, he said that, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I am meek and lowly, and you shall find rest unto yourselves. Did you know this is not the way most people picture God? God is almighty. I believe that he is the top of the food chain. I believe that nobody has any power or dominion over God. He is almighty, but he doesn't act that way. He came to us humbly. He humbled himself. 
Matter of fact, it says in uh, Philippians chapter 2 that being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That's a little awkward in the King James, but what it's just saying is that he knew he was equal to God. He was God. He didn't think it was wrong or inappropriate. He was God, and yet he humbled himself and became a man and took upon himself flesh. God Almighty became a human being. That is infathomable, however you say that. That's incomprehensible. The scripture says that he holds the universe in the palm of his hand, that he can span the heavens with his hands. That means that the entire universe from one end to the other is no bigger than the width of his hand. That's big. And yet, Almighty God, who is so big, entered into a physical body and limited himself to a physical body. You know, I'm not trying to diminish the cross and what Jesus suffered at all. That was huge. But it wasn't only on the cross that Jesus suffered. For God Almighty, who was infinite and the heavens of the heavens couldn't even contain him, to put himself in a physical body and be contained to a physical body to where if he wanted to go somewhere, he had to walk or ride something. He could go to the other end of the universe and yet now he's confined to a body that's limited to this, to this earth. Jesus humbled himself, limited himself, suffered the entire time that he was in his physical body, not just on the cross. And he did all of that because he loved us. And yet this is the nature of God. God is a humble God. And it says that, he doesn't, that God's kind of love envieth not. You know, I looked up, here's the definition of what envy means. According to the dictionary, it means discontented desire or resentment aroused by another's possessions, achievements, or advantages. Now think about this. Man, there is nothing that the Lord envied that we had. None of our possessions, none of our achievements, or advantages. There's nothing in us that God desired. He didn't come because He had to have us and what we possessed. He was envious and wanted all of these things. We didn't have a thing to offer God except our mess. There are some people that would take offense at what I'm saying because you think, oh, you don't know who I am. I was really a great person and I'm a feather in the hat of God. God is lucky to have me on his side. There's a lot of people that think that way, but your thinking is wrong. I can guarantee you God loved us just because he is loved, not because we deserved it. Over in the 16th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, it talks about how God found us. He was talking to the nation of Israel, and he said that you were polluted in your blood in the day that you were born. You were like a baby that was born and thrown into the dirt, and you had dirt caked up upon you with all of the birth fluids. Your navel wasn't cut. You were polluted in your own blood. You were a despicable, ugly thing, and I chose you and I made you my own and adopted you to myself. Some of you have a higher opinion of yourself than that, but the truth is that you know what? Without God, there wasn't a one of us in here that was worth redeeming. It's not because you were a jewel in his crown. God just chose to love you, and that's what this is saying. It, God's kind of love envies not. If you were talking about a person... A true person who's operating in God's kind of love will not sit there and be nice to a person because of what it advantages them. It's not because you're after their possession, after their recognition, their advantage, uh, whatever it could advantage you. That is a selfish motivation. God, His kind of love just loves people and it doesn't desire something from them. You don't love in order to get. Man, I could spend weeks trying to amplify on this because again most Christians today really do not have a good revelation of God's kind of love and they think that God does give with strings attached. God says I will heal you if you will go to church, if you'll pay your tithes, if you'll do this. I bet you that there's probably nearly every person in here at one time or another has been in a crisis situation and you have prayed and said, God, if you'll get me out of this, I promise you I'll go to church. I'll pay my tithes. I'm going to start doing this. I'll live right. I'm going to quit drinking. I'm going to quit 
I won't dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do. Praise God, I am going to serve you. You know what that is? You think that God only ministers to you when it advantages Him, when He can get something in return. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. And that's what we've been taught. This is what religion teaches. That in order for you to get a prayer answered, you've got to start reading your Bible, you've got to pray, you've got to do this, this, and this. And when you do so much holiness, then God responds to you. What that's saying is that love is envious. It does seek an advantage. It does desire the things that it can gain from you. But God's kind of love is not that way. God loves us completely independent of any worth in our part. If you could get hold of this, this would revolutionize your life. You know, I said earlier, right after Charlie and Jill got through singing, that once you understand that Jesus died for you, that ought to end the whole discussion right there. If we got a revelation of that, but we've got religion over here that says, oh yeah, he died for you, but if you don't go to church, if you don't pay your tithes, if you don't live holy, if you don't do this, if you get mad without a cause, God won't answer your prayer. God will let you die. God will cause your business to fail. He'll make your children to be born with some kind of a birth defect. He will do this. And religion has said those things, which just undoes the love that was manifest in the cross. And then, here's another doctrine that comes along. They say, oh yeah, your sins were forgiven up until the point that you made Jesus your Lord. But now, every time you sin, you've got to go back to the Lord and get that sin confessed and under the blood. And if you don't, then God, there's two different manifestations. Some will say God will completely forsake you. You could have been born again for 30 years and yet if you don't live holy and if you die with an unconfessed sin in your life, you'll go to hell. And that's the harsh interpretation. A lesser interpretation is that, oh, you won't go to hell. You'll still be saved. But God won't fellowship with you and God won't answer your prayer and God won't use you. It's the same thing. It's just a lesser consequence and this is what religion has taught us. And you know what that does? That means that God's love is envious. It is seeking an advantage. You've got to do something. In other words, God will love you if you'll love Him. If you'll do what He told you to do, then God will do what He said He'll do. And that is not what God's kind of love is. Look over here in Romans chapter 8 at some verses. It says all of this, and it's amazing how this is just so prevalent in the Word of God, and yet our religious traditions make us miss these things. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 31, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. If you stop and thought about that, let me ask you this. How much were you seeking God, fasting and praying, going to church, paying your tithes, living holy and doing everything right before you got born again? Most of us were living a sorry life and God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. He commended His love towards you when you weren't seeking Him. You received the greatest miracle that will ever be, which is being born again. And you received that when you hadn't done anything. You weren't worthy. You hadn't been fasting and praying. You couldn't say, God, I've done all of these things. Now save me because I believe for it. Man, you had to come and sing just as I am without one plea. And if God loved you so much to extend his love to you in a situation like that, it says how much more now will he uh, freely give us all of these things? Amen? Oh, I'm back. No wonder I couldn't find that. I was over in 1 Corinthians 13. So it says over here, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Notice it says freely. In other words, it's not a barter system. You live holy over here and God will do something for you. 
You know what I'm saying is profound. But there are people sitting right here thinking, now wait a minute, I can think about this. It says, you know, you've got to do this and this and this. I, I could get plumb off the subject and go to teaching about the difference between the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant did say, you have to do these things and then I'll respond. But in the New Covenant, Jesus has already done it. In the Old Covenant, Jesus hadn't healed anybody yet. And so the only way you could get healed in a sense was on credit. You do certain things and then God responds and on credit gives you healing. But in the New Testament, you don't do something to get healed. By His stripes you were healed 2,000 years ago. You don't do anything to get God to heal you. God has already healed you is what the Scripture says. You don't do things to get God to forgive you. Man, I'm just, I'm countering so much stuff here. I hope you're sticking with me through this. But the scripture, you know, tradition, religion says you have to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and ask Jesus to come into your heart. That's not scriptural. Thank you for that one. Come on, Pastor Bobby. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, now wait a minute, you do too have to ask Jesus to come into your heart. That's not what the Bible says. You don't have to ask Him to forgive your sins. You don't have to confess your sins to get God to forgive you. If you believe that, what would happen if you forgot one? Does that mean it's not covered? That would put the burden of salvation on your memory. Are you willing to make your eternal salvation dependent upon whether you remember every sin that you've committed? Man, praise God that isn't so. The scripture doesn't tell you to confess your sins and ask God to forgive you. First John chapter 1 verse 9 does say you can... Man, how do I answer all of this stuff? There's just so much religion to counter. Let me just say this. You know the only other time in scripture in the New Testament that it tells you to confess your sins is in James chapter 5 when it's talking about praying one for another and when there is strife among brothers you go to them and you confess your sin. I believe 1 John 1 9 is talking about if you read it in its context it's talking about when you are having strife and when you're thinking that you don't have any sin and stuff you need to confess your sins one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. But your salvation and your forgiveness from God is not dependent upon you confessing every sin. If it was, you couldn't be saved because you don't even know every sin that you've ever committed. You can't remember every one. The Scripture doesn't tell you to confess your sins like that for the purpose of forgiveness of sins. It talks about for relationship and reconciliation with brother. When the Philippian jailer came to Paul and Silas in the 16th chapter of Acts, I believe it's around verse 30 or 31, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they didn't say, well, ask Jesus to come into your heart. Ask Jesus to forgive your sins. Do all of these things. That's not what he said. He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved and your house. Believe what? Believe that Jesus already came and died for the sins of the whole world. 1 John chapter 2 verse 2 says that He, Jesus, is the propitiation, that means the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Did you know Jesus has forgiven the sins of the whole world? Individual sins aren't the problem. He's forgiven the sins of the homosexual, the liar, the murderer, the adulterer. The only sin that the Holy Spirit is convicting of, John chapter 16 verse 8 says that when He is come, the Holy Spirit, He will convict the world of sin, singular, and of uh, righteousness and of judgment. And then in verse 9, He explains what sin it is He's talking about. In verse 9, it says, of sin because they believe not on me. The sin that the Holy Spirit convicts of is not believing on Jesus. People go to hell for rejecting the payment for their sins, not their individual sins. Their sins have been paid for. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And if people go to hell, it's because they rejected that payment for their sin. This answers a bunch of other questions. People think, well now, wait a minute. I can understand Hitler going to hell who killed six million Jews and a lot of others and people like that. It doesn't seem fair 
that a person who just didn't accept Jesus, but they lived a relatively good life and never killed anybody and never robbed or murdered, how could they go to hell and suffer right alongside Hitler? Because it's not your individual sins, murder or religion or whatever that sends you to hell. It's the singular sin of rejecting Jesus. And if you truly understood what a huge payment that is, what a tremendous payment it was for God to become a man and for 33 years walk this earth in the form of a human being and suffer being human and then suffer the rejection of his own people and the payment and then go to hell and do all of these things. If you could understand that, that that is what sends people to hell, then there isn't a hell deep enough or an eternity long enough to punish a person for rejecting such a great salvation. It's not your individual actions of sin. Before Jesus came, yes, that did separate us from God and that was justification for going to hell. But now the person who rejects Jesus, whether it's through rebellion or through ignoring Him and just thinking He's not important enough to merit your attention... The, per the person who rejects Jesus, that is infinitely worse than being a homosexual, than being a murderer, than being a liar, than being a thief. It doesn't even compare. And if you understand that, now you can understand how that there isn't a hell number two or a hell number three. That man, if you reject Jesus, there isn't a hell deep enough or an eternity long enough to punish a person who would spurn such a great gift from God. Man, the Lord paid a huge price. And as it says right here, I'm back in Romans chapter 8 in verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justified. God has justified. The word justified is a... Is a literal term, it's a legal term, and I could go into all the ramifications, but the little simple definition, layman's definition, it'll help you to understand, it just means just as if I'd never sinned. Justified, never sinned. It, it just declares you free from the guilt and penalty of sin. That's what Jesus did. Jesus declared you free, not only from the sin up until the time you got born again, but He forgave you of all sin, even the ones that you haven't committed yet. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, 14. Hebrews 10, 10 and 14, and, and Hebrews 12, 23 says that. That's another message. If you hadn't heard that one, man, you need to figure that out. That's awesome. But He forgave you of all sins and you have been sanctified and made perfect forever. Not just until the next time you sin. You have been perfected forever. Not in your physical body, but in your spirit man. Your spirit man is righteous and holy and pure. And John 4, 24 says God is a spirit and God is looking at you in the spirit and you are holy and pure and righteous. I know some of you, it's just like tilt, overload, <laughs> reboot. Uh, I know some of you think, I've never heard anything like this, obviously. <laughs> Look at this again in Romans chapter 8. It says in verse 33, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? According to most Christians, it's God. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's showing me how wrong I am. The Holy Spirit's been on my case. The Holy Spirit's always telling me that I need to pray more, do this more, or something else. You're saying that God is the one who is doing all of these things. This is saying it's not God. God is the one who justifies. And then in the next verse, Who is he that condemns? Most Christians wouldn't say it in these terms, but most Christians would say it's God who's made you feel miserable. It's God who makes you constantly sin conscious and who is condemning you. Religion actually fosters that and encourages it. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2, the last part of verse 2 says, so that you should have no more conscience of sin. You should not be sin conscious. And when I say that, some people just panic. 
Like, oh man, if I wasn't sin conscious and if I wasn't constantly aware of how I failed, nothing would restrain me. I'd just be out living in sin. There's no telling what I would do. That's not true. That's not true. Sin consciousness, man, I could get off and preach on a lot of stuff, but the Bible says that the law strengthened sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56. The law strengthened sin. The law is a ministration of condemnation and doubt and unbelief. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through the end of the chapter, and on and on. Uh, it says in Romans 7, I was alive without the law, but when the law came, sin revived and I died. When you go to preaching about, to people about how great a sinner they are and how God is angry at you and God's upset if you've sinned, it actually makes sin come alive on the inside of people. That was the purpose of the Old Testament law. I know some of you are thinking, this just is strange. Everything I've been saying, I've been quoting scripture to you. I hadn't given a quote on everyone, but it, that's what the Bible says. This is saying, who is he that condemns? It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? The law that when you sin, you get death. The wages of sin is death. And the law of the spirit of life in me has set me free from the law of sin and of death. I am not under condemnation, even though I still don't do everything right. God isn't imputing sin unto me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18 and 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing man's trespasses unto them. He's not holding your sins against you. The reason I'm hitting all of these things, people say, why are you countering everything I've ever been taught? Because it's these things that we've been taught that have lessened the sacrifice of Jesus. We thought that God only forgave us up until the time we got born again and then every time we sin, we lose it and it's now dependent upon us to keep ourselves saved and to do all of this. God forgave you of sin, past, present, and future. God is not angry at you. He's not holding your sins against you. Who is the one that's condemning you? It's not God. It's Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? According to most religious people, nearly anything. Just don't read your Bible and you're separated from the love of Christ. God, he may not send you to hell, but he won't bless you and he's not going to have fellowship with you. God won't have anything to do with you when you're doing wrong. This says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This love that God extended towards us when we first got born again, He has never cut off the spigot. He never, do, he never does anything to diminish His love towards you. And yet I can just, some of you are saying, but wait a minute, when I go out and sin, I don't feel the love of God. I don't have His joy. I don't have His peace. God quit flowing through me. That's not what happens. God doesn't fold his arms and say, all right, until you repent and get back on target, I'm not going to bless you. You won't have any joy. You won't have any peace. That's not it. God's arms are always open towards you. Nothing will ever separate him from you. But when you go live in sin, it's not God that turns away from you. It's you that turns away from him. God's love towards you never fluctuates based on your performance. I'm getting all of this from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, where it says he envies not. He is not after something that you've got. It's not based on some advantage of you to him. God loves you unconditional. 
He loves you without your performance. God loves you because He is love, not because you are lovely. God just loves you and there's nothing that you can do about it. But you can do things that will keep you from accepting it. You can sit there and watch pornography and stuff like this and you know what? That will allow the devil to come in and put all kinds of evil desires and you won't feel the love of God. You will be feeling the lust and all these other things, but it doesn't change God's love towards you. God loves you just as much. You just won't recognize it. You won't experience it. So I do agree that when you go out and live in sin, there is a diminished awareness of God's presence, but it's not God who shut the spigot off. It's you who shut it off. And so, yes, you need to live right, but not so that God could love you. God never has loved you based on your goodness. He loves you because of Jesus and you accepted Jesus and that is why God is passionate about you. God is love and He just chose to love you. And the moment you tie God's love to some worth and some value on your part, then you have lessened it. You've reduced it to a human type of love where you only love when it's advantageous for you. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's saying that God's kind of love Envy's not. It's not after anything. It's not trying to do something good in order to get you to do something good for them. God loves you independent of your ability to do anything for Him. He just loves you because He is love. Man, that is powerful. And brothers and sisters, we need to renew our mind with this because in the world system, we don't see this unconditional type of love. Most people will love you when you're worth loving, when you do something good. You come home as a little kid and sing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you sing your alphabet, and then you say, now I've said my ABCs. Tell me what you think of me. And they go, oh, you're wonderful. We're so proud of you. And when you do good, they brag on you. My kid is an honor student at such and such high school. But let you mess up and see what they do. They'll ground you. They'll spank you. They'll say something to you. The whole world system operates on a performance-based thing. As long as you are beneficial, people will love you and keep you and promote you and do whatever. But mess up and you'll, you'll pay for it. God's not like that. It's counterintuitive. It's different than any other relationship that you've ever had. And unless you go to the Word and read these things, what will separate me from the love of God? If God died for me, if He loved me so much that He sent His Son to die for me, how much more now that I'm born again will He give me all things freely without bartering, with me, without me having to turn in three good deeds to get one answered prayer in the results? That's what religion is teaching, but that is not an accurate representation. And if you haven't received this unconditional love from God, you can't turn around and give it to people. People are treating other people the way that they think they are treated. I remember a marriage counseling thing one time where a woman was just talking about how her husband was treating her and I just had a word of knowledge and I started saying, here's what's happened. This man, this is the way he's been taught. He has always been rejected. He was raised under performance and because of it, that's all he knows. And he's treating you based on your performance. He's giving you no mercy. He's giving you no grace. People don't understand this, but I told, I told the wife, I said, you're expecting him to love you. I said, he's never accepted love. He's never received love. He can't give away what he doesn't have. He needs a revelation of God's love. Here's another example. I had a Bible college student who, when he came to school, the very first day of Bible college, I got up and said something about the stock market and how people did things in the stock market. And anyway, this guy came up after the thing and corrected me. Do you remember this guy? <laughs> Wendell does, if I could tell him. But anyway, this guy came up and corrected me because I didn't say something that was technically correct. What I was saying was correct. I just, you know, didn't have the technical stuff down. So anyway, he came up and rebuked me. And from that time on, for the next six months or whatever, I never spoke without him correcting me over something. 
He corrected everything. Sometimes I'd say it's 1 Corinthians 6.10 and it was 6.11 and he would come up and point it out. This guy was a genius. He knew just about everything. And I couldn't say anything without him coming up and correcting me. And I mean, I spoke four times a day, uh, five days a week, and four times a day, five days a week, he would come up and correct me and tell me something that I was wrong. And most of the, I guess every time, he was right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> And finally, he came up to me about six months into this thing, and he says, I hope you aren't offended, but I just want to tell you. And I knew he was going to correct me over something. And I said, well, I am offended. And he just looked at me and he said, well, why would you be offended? And I said, did you know that you, just, you never have complimented me? You've never said one nice thing ever. All you do is look for something wrong. And you've criticized everything over the tiniest little thing when you knew that it was a slip or something like that. And yet you just constantly criticize. And I said, let me tell you, this is why there isn't a single person in this Bible school that likes you. <laughs> I said, there's not a person in this Bible school who befriends you because you are a pain. I said, all you do is point out people's faults. And I just unloaded on this guy. I didn't say it out of bitterness. I just thought he needed to know. And I just told this guy, I said, you are a royal pain. And nobody likes you and nobody's going to like you because of the way you act. And did you know when I went home that day, I felt kind of bad about the way I just dumped on him. <laughs> and you know what I did? I got to praying, and the Lord gave me a word of knowledge about him and showed me why he was like he was. And so I invited him and his wife out to lunch the next day, and I went to lunch and I guess he was expecting me to dump on him again. I don't know. He was really quiet. <laughs> and I just told him, I said, I, the Lord showed me in a dream what your problem is and what happened. And I just began to read his mail. And I said, your dad never accepted you. Your dad was so critical, he pointed out everything, and you decided that you were going to learn all there was to know. You were going to become so smart trying to gain people's acceptance. And I said, it comes across that you are critical and you're against people, but that's, it's ex really the opposite. What you're trying to do is impress people so that people will think something of you and you don't let them just accept you. You've got to show your superiority so that they would accept you. And when I got to saying these things, this guy just broke down in a restaurant and got to crying. He says, man, that's all true. And I was able to help him and help him get through that thing. But anyway, my point in all of this is, see that people are thinking they've got to do something to impress you. I've got to earn your favor. I've got to do this. And in the natural realm, a lot of that is true because we're dealing with fallen human beings. But with God, that is not the way it is. There is nothing that you can do that will increase your value in the sight of God. Think about that. If you fast, if you pray, if you study the Word, if you go to church, if you pay your tithes, if you do every single thing right, that'll help you. It'll renew your mind. It'll make your heart more sensitive towards God. But it doesn't increase your value, your worth, God's desire to love you or move in your life one bit. God loves you independent of your performance. His kind of love is not after anything. There is nothing that you can give Him that God needs. God is not envious of a single thing that you've got. He just loves you because He is love. And when you actually start trying to make yourself worthy, what you do is get in the way of God's love. You cheapen it, thinking that it's uh, like a human love. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Unless you do something for God, God won't respond to you. But God commended His love towards you in that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. And then the next verse, Romans 5, 9 says, Much more, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. If God loved you while you were a sinner so that He sent Jesus and died for you, now that you have become a saint and that you've accepted that salvation, He loves you much more. Not much less. 
He loves you much more. He is not in this relationship for what he can gain from it. He is in this relationship for what he can give. And so many of us have never experienced an absolutely pure love with no ulterior motive. And we just, we just can't understand that that's the way that God loves us. And then you factor religion in that has come and said, unless you do this and this and this, God won't answer your prayer and God will turn from you. And it's really confused it. But I'm trying to get across that God's kind of love doesn't envy. It's not after a single thing. You've got nothing to offer Him except He just wants you. He doesn't want anything that you have. He just wants you. I'm going to move on. I'm going really fast tonight. It says that it envies not charity or God's kind of love, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. In verse 5, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Here again, let me read one of these translations to you. The NIV says, Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. The uh, Amplified here says that um, it pays no attention to a suffered wrong. All of these, again, are talking about how that we're supposed to walk in love towards others, but I'm trying to say that if God expects us to act towards other people this way, He certainly will do at least what He commanded us to do. And God isn't self-serving. When it says that love does not behave itself unseemly, the word unseemly means unbecoming. You know, again, there's just so much to counter because our society today, we use the word love to talk about lust and all kinds of degenerate sexual behavior and attitudes and we lump it all together and many of you think this is love. You know, Jamie and I were in a marriage seminar one time. There was 45 couples there. And they had everybody go around and the very first night all they did was talk about how they meant and how they got together and how they got married. And there was 45 couples and Jamie and I and one other couple came together in the Lord. God told Jamie and me that we were going to be married before we ever held hands. And we were engaged to be married before we ever held hands or kissed. God put us together supernaturally. Every other person, it was like I was in a bar and I saw this person come through. And man, I took her to bed and we had relationships. And the next morning we woke up and found out we were married. We don't even know how it happened. And I mean, it was some kind of a story like that. And, you know... Not all of us were born again before we got married. I'm not criticizing anybody, but I'm saying that out of 45 couples, 43, that's the way their relationship started. And let me just give you a hint. That was not God that put them together. That was not love. That was lust. And this is the way most of those relationships started in lust. And then they just, when they get born again... They just assume that it was all God and they have all kinds of attitudes that weren't godly. It was total carnal. It was total flesh. And they just think, well, we love each other, but it's not God's kind of love. At the very best, it is a human love, which is limited. And probably it was lust. And many couples just start with that and just somehow or another think it's going to work out. These are some of the characteristics of God's kind of love. It says it never behaves itself unseemly. It never misbehaves. How many times have you watched some kind of a movie and a person is supposedly in love with their mate, but then somebody walks by and boing, they just fall in love. And they don't want it. They resist it. They try and remain faithful, but they can't help themselves. I can't help it. I just lost my love for you. And now I'm in love with this person. I'm sorry. I don't want it. It just happened. Hollywood is presented love like that. That is not love. That is lust. Thank you for that one, amen. 
What many of you think is love is not love. It is a lust. It's emotional. You feel it. You fall in love and you fall out of love. <laughs> Let me share a scripture with you out of Titus chapter 2. You ought to turn over and read this one. You won't believe this is in the Bible. <laughs> Titus chapter 2. Titus is writing to the older women... And he says in Titus chapter 2, verse 3, the aged women, or the older women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know, on the surface, that doesn't look like much of a verse. People think, well, that's just kind of a little instructions. What does that have to do with me? Look at this. This is just profound. In verse, um, in verse 4, the older women are supposed to teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Did you know that our world today does not believe you can just choose to love a person? You can't teach yourself to love a person. You either love them or you don't. There's just chemistry or there isn't. If you look at these commercials about eHarmony or Match.com or whatever, they just meet these people in Boeing, they fall in love and they fall out of love. and it, It's just chemistry. And you can't control it. That is not what the Bible says. God's kind of love is a decision. You can teach yourself. You can choose to love a person. God didn't love you because he had goosebumps going up and down his spine. <laughs> God chose to love us. God so loved the world that he gave. And I can guarantee you when Jesus hung on the cross, he wasn't just having a a wonderful time and joy and I mean all of these emotions oh this is so wonderful I just love these people I guarantee you he was suffering pain he had a lot of negative emotions it says he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin if I would have been God Almighty hanging on a cross with people spitting in my face and putting a crown of thorns on my head and slapping me and saying, prophesy and tell who it is. I guarantee you, I would have been tempted to turn him into a pile of ashes. <laughs> so he at least had the thought. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Jesus didn't just feel overwhelming compassion and love when he was hanging on the cross. He was feeling pain. And he chose to do what was right. And yet today, people think, well... I, I just think that, you know, the spark's gone out of our marriage. I just don't feel about them the way that I did. And so they, they look at that as justification for divorcing and going and getting somebody else. You know what really happened was you didn't marry him because of God's kind of love. You chose that person because she was the homecoming queen. And you could envision yourself walking down the street with her holding on your arm and thinking, everybody's going to be jealous of me. I'm going to look good. It was all selfish. And the reason the woman chose the man is because he was the football captain and he had long wavy hair and muscles and buff. And then all of a sudden you wake up someday and the guy's hair's gone. <laughs> and he got the Chester drawers disease where his chest done dropped down into his drawers. <laughs> Amen. And he's no longer strong and healthy. And she said, I just think the love is the spark's gone out of our marriage. <laughs> what it was, you didn't marry them choosing to love them and making a decision to love them. You loved them because it made you look good and you just thought, how happy, how blessed am I to have somebody like this. And then you marry her and go into the bedroom and she takes off her wig. <laughs> Then she takes off her false eyelashes and then she takes off of her makeup and takes off her fake leg. <laughs> you think, man, the love is just gone. It never was love in the first place. It was lust. You know what I'm saying could really help you. You're thinking the spark is gone. 
all it was was lust based on what you could get out of it and how they could make you look and make you feel. In the moment, you know, it's like you stick a straw in one of these cups and you suck everything out until you hear the... <laughs> like that, and when you hear that, throw that one away and let's go get another one. The love's gone out. I think I love somebody else. You're going to go suck the life out of them until you get all the good out of them. <laughs> Amen. I've actually told people before when they came in for marriage counseling, I said, do you love her the way she is? Oh, I love her. She's just awesome. And I said, you know she's not perfect. Oh, I know she's not perfect, but I love her. I think that she's wonderful. And then I'll say, do you like him the way he is? Oh, he's awesome. He's my hero. He's my Prince Charming. I said, he's not perfect. It doesn't matter. I love him. And I say, well, all right, remember this. When you got them, they were okay. <laughs> and if you ever get to where you don't like them, guess whose fault it is. They were all right when you got them. But you know, most people, it, most Christians do not understand an unconditional love where you just, I'm going to love you. And there's nothing you can do that will make me not love you. There's things you can do that I don't like. And I'm not going to necessarily just, uh, you know, help you be uh, a facilitator, or what do you call that, an enabler. I'm not going to help you do the wrong thing. So there's a time for you to stand and say this is right and this is wrong and something needs to change. But very few Christians have ever just chosen to love a person and say, I will love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Most people love a person conditional on how they look, how they act, whether they're doing everything right. And when they quit doing everything right, all of a sudden you just feel like love has gone. Love never went anywhere. Lust left. Selfishness left. I've had people before that there was a neighbor behind us when I grew up that was a principal of a school and his wife had a car wreck and in this car wreck she had brain damage and he had to spend the rest of his life taking care of her. And did you know that I actually heard people talk about that he ought to divorce her. How's this man getting his needs met? Boy, I think that is tragic. So my, well, he has needs too. That is so selfish. This is saying that God's kind of love is not self-serving. It isn't self-seeking. God doesn't love you just because you can give Him something. God loves you because you needed to be loved. You needed somebody to love you and God has chosen to love you and there's nothing you can do that will make God not love you. There's a lot of things you can do that will keep you from understanding His love and, and harden your heart towards it and dull you to the things of God and it will keep you from experiencing the joy and the benefit and so don't do those things. But God is going to love you independent of your action. And again, religion doesn't say this. Religion comes along and says that, man, every time you sin, you, you were saved, but now you're backslid. And if you die in a backslidden state, you could have been saved for 40 years, and yet you commit a sin and have a car wreck before you have time to confess it, and you go to hell. That's not an unconditional love, and that diminishes the love. That is not true. Some people, oh, yes, it is. Well, let me ask you this. The Bible says that you're supposed to obey the laws of the land. If the speed limit is 55 and you're going 56, you're breaking the command. Do you believe that if you go 56 miles an hour and have a car wreck and you didn't have time to confess it, that you would go to hell? <laughs> Many of you say, oh no, I don't believe that. Well, why not? That's breaking the law and God told you to obey the laws of the land. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 10, that if you keep the whole law and offend in one point, you become guilty of everything. So if you're going to sit there and say that sin is a new offense against God and you've got to get it confessed and under the blood, and if you don't, and if you died with an unconfessed sin, you'd go to hell. If I really believe that, then the moment you got saved, I'd just kill you. Because that's the only way you'd ever get to heaven. <laughs> I might go to hell, but that's the only way you'd ever get to heaven is to have somebody just kill you and not give you an opportunity to mess up. Because I guarantee you, you mess up. 
Some of you thought, well, I don't believe God would... I don't believe you'd go to hell for going one mile an hour over the speed limit and then dying and not having time to confess it. But what would happen if you went and committed adultery and were driving home and had a car wreck? Some of you don't believe it would happen for going 56. Well, it would happen if you committed adultery. Again, if you, break the, if you keep the whole law and fend in one point, you're guilty of all. There are no big sins or little sins. There are no good sins, acceptable sins. Sin is sin, and if you sin, and if sin is going to cause you to lose your salvation, then any sin would do it. That is a misrepresentation of God. Man, God is not self-serving. He doesn't behave himself unseemly. God controls himself. It is a choice. He is not got hormones flowing that affect his decision. <laughs> He doesn't have bad days. He doesn't just get put out with you and I'm tired of you. And yet this world system portrays love as this thing that just comes over and you can't control yourself. You try, you just couldn't do it. That's not love, it's lust. There was a lady that was in one of my churches and she was a school teacher, about 25, 26, and she had a student who was 16, I think it was, or 17, that fell in love with her, quote unquote. And he courted her and so she was dating a student in her high school class that was 10 years younger than her. Her parents hit the roof. They got us involved. Jamie and I talked to them and stuff, and she just swore that, oh, we're in love with each other. And God told us to do this. Once a person plays the God card, how do you counter it? So anyway, I didn't know exactly what to say, but then we went out to eat, and there was a group probably of ten of us, and we walked in, and they hadn't made this public to everybody that they were quote-unquote engaged. And so not everybody knew. And we walked in and sat down and we just sat at the table and people sat on both sides of this woman. And we looked up and the guy wasn't there. And we asked where so-and-so was. And she says, well, he's out in the car. I said, what's he doing in the car? Well, we just love each other so much that he, it breaks his heart not to sit next to me. And he's out in the car crying. He says, would you please... Let us sit next to each other because he just loves me so much. And she had to go out and get him and bring him in. We had to scoot over. Now I had something to tell her. And I took this exact verse. I said, God's kind of love does not behave that way. God's kind of love is not just so passionate that it can't control itself and it has to act that way. I said, that's lust. You can control God's kind of love. You will never be embarrassed with God's kind of love. When you see people that just have their hands all over each other and they can't control themselves, they ought to go get a hotel room, amen? But they, we just love each other so much. You can just write it down. That is not God's kind of love. God's kind of love does not act that way. I know I'm countering society and many of you think I'm way off. I got scripture to stand on for what I'm saying. There was a song I heard about somebody who went to bed and he couldn't close his eyes because he just loved his wife so... Or I don't even know if it was his wife. There's the person he's next to. Just loved her so much that he couldn't close his eyes. He couldn't do without her. And I wanted to just throw up. <laughs> that is not God's kind of love. That is not love. That's lust. God's kind of love doesn't behave itself unseemly. It is not self-serving. It is not self-seeking. It is not self-promoting. So much of what we're talking about love, it's this person, as long as they're doing what you want them to do, fine. And then the moment they quit being the person that just validates everything you do and they voice an opinion, well, then all of a sudden you fell out of love and you just feel like it evaporated. I can't fight it. All it is is just lust. God's not like that. God doesn't want you to live like that, and God's not like that. God does not get ticked off at you. He is not easily provoked. That's what it says right here. It seeks not our own. God is not after 
just using you. I was taught my whole life that the only way you can glorify God is to do a work for God. Do something for God. We used to have a little poem in the Baptist church that says, Mary had a little lamb. It would have been a sheep. But it joined the Baptist church and died from lack of sleep. I mean, in the Baptist church, they'd work you to death. I went to church five nights a week, every, every week of my life. And I was told that the only way you can glorify God is to do a work for God. Do a work for God. But you know what? God wants you. Not what you can do for Him. Now, if He gets you, He'll get everything that he needs because you will serve him out of love. So I'm not saying that service isn't important, but that right here in this chapter, if you speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but if you don't have God's kind of love, you're like a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. You're just a gong. You're just making noise. If you can prophesy and understand all mysteries and if you don't have God's kind of love, you're nothing. If you give all of your goods to feed the poor and if you give your body to be burned and don't have it with God's kind of love, it's nothing. The Lord told the, the elder of the church at Ephesus that you, you've done all of these things. Man, you are righteous. You're doing this. You're dealing with the uh, hypocrites. You're doing all of these things. You're doing everything right, but you've left your first love. Repent or I'm going to take everything away from you. God was more after their heart than he was their service. It's all about relationship. God wants you, not what you do for him. God isn't after just using you and then throw you aside and go get somebody else. God loves you. The very reason that God isn't using some of you is because he loves you so much. You may not understand that. But if God was to put you in a position of leadership and answer your prayers and give you the opportunities that you want, you aren't mature enough to handle it. And God will literally let His kingdom suffer because He doesn't want to abuse you. He doesn't want to hurt you. He doesn't want to put you out in front and then have you fall because you aren't able to handle it. God loves you that much. God is not in this for Himself. God loves you unconditionally. And many of us haven't ever received this kind of love, and so therefore we aren't showing this kind of love to other people. It says here that it's not easily provoked. Most people believe God has a very short fuse. It doesn't take much to tick God off. But that's not true. God is the absolute opposite of what many people have thought. And God is not easily provoked. God loves us. He's patient. He's kind towards us. And notice it says he thinks no evil. I touched on this this morning out of Philippians chapter 4, but he told us to think on things that are honest and pure and lovely and just and are of good report. If there's virtue and praise, think on these things. God doesn't think evil. God doesn't focus on the evil in your life. He doesn't look at all of the problems in your life. God is looking at the good that He's done in your life. God believes in you more than you believe in you. Not your natural self, not your carnal abilities, but the born again you. He sees you. And it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that you are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In the spirit man, you have everything that there is. The mind of Christ, you have all of this ability. God believes in you. God is for you. He's not thinking on the evil. That is absolutely awesome. It says in verse 6, Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. You know what? There are many people that just feel like God told you not to do something. You go out and do it anyway, and God says, I told you so. You're going to reap what you sowed. I told you not to do it, and you're just going to have to swallow it. You knew better than this. People act that way, but God doesn't. God will never sit there and rub your nose in it. God will never punish you. He's already punished His Son. He put all of His wrath upon Jesus. There isn't any wrath left in God for you. 
For those who don't accept Jesus, there is a future wrath. God's not venting it right now. But if a person doesn't accept Jesus, there still is a holiness and a wrath of God. But for any person who's a believer, God punished you, or God punished Jesus for you, and He will never punish you. If He was to punish you, it would be double jeopardy. It would be invalidating what His Son has done. If God gets angry at you, He would be unjust then in putting His anger against you on Jesus because He punished Him and you. I read those verses this morning out of uh, Isaiah chapter 54 that He'll never be wroth with you nor angry and His covenant of peace will never depart and neither will His kindness ever leave you. It's an unconditional covenant. God is not mad at you. And I know that this goes contrary to our religious tradition that teaches it's all conditional and it's only momentary until the next time we sin and everything else, but I'm doing everything I can to counter this and show you from Scripture that God does not rejoice in iniquity, but He rejoices in the truth. Look at this in verse 7. I'm trying to get through this quickly. I'm going to quit in the name of Jesus. But he, he uh, bears all things. God's kind of love bears all things. And God is love. Jesus is love. So Jesus bears all things. All things. Most people believe he'll put up with a little bit. But not all things. I've had people come to me by the hundreds in marriage counseling and they say, Hey, what are, you know, I just can't stand it anymore. I can't bear anymore. And they feel justified. And most people will tell people that. You know, you're only human. You can only take so much. What I tell people is, when you say, I can't bear it anymore, that means that you've never tried God. Because God's kind of love bears all things. If your love has come to its limits and I can't bear this anymore, it's because you aren't operating in God's kind of love. You're operating in human love, just lust. God's kind of love will bear all things. There is no limit to what God can do. And that's not only true in our relationships with others, but that's true in God's relationship with you. Amen. There's nothing you can do that will offend God. God has already placed all of your sin on Jesus and there's nothing you can do that will diminish His love for you. There's nothing you can do that will make Him love you more. God loves you independent of you. There's nothing you can do about it. It bears all things. It believes all things. Did you know God believes in you? I quoted that verse. I misquoted it this morning. Out of uh, I said it was in Philippians chapter 1. It's actually in 1 Timothy chapter 1 where God counted me faithful and put me in the ministry. God has faith in you. God is believing in you. And that's awesome. If God believes in you, who are you to disbelieve in yourself? What makes your opinion better than God? Who do you think you are? What right do you have to reject God's opinion of you? Man, those are strong statements. It says it hopes all things. Love produces hope. If you don't have hope, it's because you have not received God's love for you. The moment you receive God's love, I guarantee you, your hope will go through the roof. You will start believing and envisioning things and thinking, man, things are going to get better. It doesn't matter if the bill collector is knocking on your door, if the doctor is telling you you're going to die. It doesn't matter. When you understand love, your hope just goes through the roof. If you are hopeless, if you're depressed... It's because you aren't operating in love. You aren't thinking on how much God loves you. Our hope would be there. And you'd be able to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, and endure all things. Again, people just say, I've, you know, I've got, ends, I've got limits to my endure, endurement. And how do you say that? Endurance. Thank you. I've got limits to my endurance. But if you're in God, if you're in love, it it endures all things. If you say that you've reached the limit, it's because you aren't into the God yet. You aren't into your spirit. You're doing it in your own human ability and you haven't let God start living through you yet. Man, I had a lot of other things I was wanting to say, but the heart can't absorb more than the seat can endure. In verse 8 it says, Charity, or God's kind of love, never fails. 
God never fails in His love towards you. Human love fails. Everything in this natural world is polluted and corrupted, but I'm telling you, God's love for you is pure. I just pray that somehow or another you could understand that. You know, I experienced God's love in a tangible way 44 years ago next month. 44 years ago, for four and a half months, I was caught up in the presence of God, and it changed my life. But you know what? I wouldn't wish that experience on anybody because it becomes addictive. You get hooked on the emotions, on the physical high. And you know what? I nearly died after that. I got sent to Vietnam and the emotion wore off. And in Vietnam, I spent 13 months asking God to kill me, not because of Vietnam or because of any of that. It was because I had felt the love of God. I had this emotional thing and I no longer had the emotion. And I panicked. How do I get it back? And I nearly got killed twice in one day in Vietnam. And I realized I wasn't as excited about dying as I thought I was. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I think I'm praying wrong. I think I need to to live and I didn't know how to live without this and so I just I didn't know what to do and so I just stuck my nose in the Bible and I started reading scripture and the Holy Spirit started speaking to me and God started teaching me that he loved me it wasn't a feeling it had, I didn't feel anything I felt lonely I felt by myself. I felt all kinds of things. I felt fear sometimes. I felt all kinds of stuff in Vietnam, but I started getting the knowledge that God loved me. And I started just speaking the love of God to me completely opposite to what I feel. And I tell you, it was hard. It was like coming off a drug addiction where you've been hooked on something and I had had emotions and I wanted the emotion back. But... God just spoke to me through the Word and I started walking in the love of God as a choice, not a feeling, and it is infinitely better than just feeling the love of God because feelings come and go. You cannot totally control feelings. If you get tired, your feelings are going to be affected. If you get sick, your feelings are going to be affected. Emotions go up and down. If you are depending upon feeling the love of God in order to know that He loved you, then you'll never be consistent. You're going to have to just grab hold of truths and you're going to have to stand in the Word of God and minister the love of God to yourself and stand on it. And so again, I'm saying I wouldn't pray that anybody has just an emotional experience because the vast majority of people can't get past that emotion. Once they feel it, they just want to constantly be caught up in this emotional high. It is much better to believe it. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. God wants you to believe that He loves you just because His Word says it. And I've taken a lot of scriptures tonight and trying to convince you, and I've got a lot more I'll be sharing tomorrow, but you just need to get hold of the Word of God and start speaking the love of God to yourself. Amen?
Thank you.